This is the third in a series of meaningful mealtime lessons with Peter. And I believe this occasion happens at a breakfast. It's taken from a passage in John 21, after the resurrection. <coughs> Jesus comes down to the Sea of Galilee to meet his disciples. And starting at verse 15 of chapter 21, read, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes. Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I tell you the truth, when you were younger and you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Now this was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You know, I like breakfast, and I have often invited men to meet with me at breakfast. I find that I can get a lot more done when a guy is on duty rather than waiting until he's off duty to talk to him. Jesus may have felt that way because he went down to meet his disciples for breakfast. If Jesus were to call you and ask if you could have breakfast with him tomorrow morning, would you be there? Would you wonder what the agenda was going to be? Maybe stay awake thinking about it at night a little bit. It was a very natural thing for them to be in the Galilee. Jesus had spent a lot of time there. He had uh, called five of his disciples from one of the towns around the Sea of Galilee. It was home to many of them. And the disciples on this occasion had been fishing all night, and the Bible says they had caught nothing. So Jesus comes and he stands along the shore, and maybe it's, twilight and maybe a little ways away from where they are and he's his friend. Haven't you any fish? Uh, the, the word there, uh, friends, haven't you any fish, is kind of interesting. Uh, the Greek actually says, boy, haven't you any fish? And Ray Vanderlaan thinks maybe they were all young, maybe some of them were still teenagers. But Peter was, uh, was married, at least he had a mother-in-law. And on this occasion, Jesus tells professional fishermen how to fish. He says to them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. They hesitated, because after all, they're the ones who know how to fish. What does the clergyman know about fishing? But we read, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. One of the gospels says 153, actually. And Peter, Peter suddenly recognizes this isn't just an ordinary guy, and he recognizes the sound of that voice, and he knows that it's Jesus, and so he couldn't wait. There's something about being with Jesus that just had to happen again, and so even though the relationship must have been strained because Peter had denied him three times not long ago, he jumps out of the boat and heads into shore. He needed to be close to Jesus. The story tells us that Jesus had a fire going and he had some fish on cooking, cooking his own breakfast. And so he says to them, bring some of what you caught and put it on the fire. Let's have breakfast together. And so he invites them to have a meal. Mealtime conversations sometimes can be painful. Sometimes they can be very healing. Hopefully, what is said and what is done is in love. And you know that Peter had denied Jesus three times just a few days earlier than this. 
And now Jesus is going to ask Peter about his love life. Three times he's specifically going to ask him, Peter, do you love me? But the word in the Greek changes. The first time Peter is asked, do you agape me? Peter can't come up to the standard of agape and says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. That's a friendship love. That's, that's not the selfless kind of love. You know that I phileo you. So Jesus gives him an assignment and says, feed my lambs. They're the little cute sheep. They're easy to love, easy to care for. And Jesus says, okay, if you are my friend, feed my lambs. But then he asks him a second time, Peter, do you truly love me? And the word here, again, is agape. It's that selfless love. Peter just can't come up to that standard, so he answers him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I am your friend. Well, Jesus gives Peter an assignment and says, then I need for you to feed my sheep. But he asks him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? In other words, are you truly my friend? <clears throat> now, now Peter is frustrated because Jesus has dropped the standard. It tells us that he was hurt because on the third time, Jesus asked him, are you really my friend, phileo? Peter answers, of course, you know all things. You know that I am your friend. Friend. We can't come above that standard. And Jesus then gives him the assignment of feeding and taking care of his sheepfold. Then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you tied your own belt and went, your, went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will put out your hand, and someone else will tie you and take you where you do not want to go. And then Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. There's a price to serving Jesus. Now I have to tell you, it's a wonderful life and very, very satisfying. The center of God's will is the best place to be, but there is a price. And sometimes, sometimes it's a matter of having someone else help you, even to this extent as Jesus was telling Peter. First thing I see in this story is you and I need to come to the point where we don't expect things to be always fair. There is a responsibility that Jesus gives when he talks about feeding his sheep, taking care of his lambs, and taking care of the sheepfold that sometimes is absolutely overwhelming. My own personal call to be a pastor, I struggled with it. And it was a, it had a price. I had to prepare at great cost, pull up everything and go get an education, get ready to do this. I have to tell you that serving Jesus is a privilege, but sometimes it's hard to accept. And like Peter, we have a tendency to want to shift the focus. Well, if you want me to do this, Lord, what are you going to make this guy do? What about him? What about her? And we want to know, if, is it going to be fair? It's not always fair. It's not always equal. The feeling that we have is, well, we'll do our part, but you know, I don't want to carry everybody's load. So if everyone else will do their part, I'll do my part, and let's keep it fair and equitable. But you know what? You and I need to be took. We can't tell Jesus how to be Lord. We can't tell him how to run the kingdom. And we can't even always tell him where to use us. He uses us where he needs us. The second thing I see in this passage is that you and I need to get over trying to compare ourselves with someone else. What he's asking us to do with what he's asking someone else to do. We have a tendency to look around and we want the other guy to, to be engaged also. We want the other guy to sacrifice as well. So what does the other guy have to do? But our comparison with someone else never take in all the factors. We can't see the whole picture. Jesus can. Peter wanted to know about his own death. How am I going to die? But how's John going to die? If, you're, if I'm going to have to go where I don't want to go and be dressed 
by somebody else. Uh, what about John? So Jesus, in essence, tells John, that's none of your business. I want to know if his is going to be more spectacular than mine. If mine is going to have more suffering in it than his. Jesus says, if I want him to live until I come back, that's not your business. You follow me. So what I learn as I look at this is that comparison is not really what matters. What matters is commitment. So Jesus treated Peter as an individual. He knew what his abilities were. He knew what his gifts were. And each assignment, whether to Peter or you or me, is unique and special according to the way we've been gifted. It fits us perfectly. But the risk is high. And the sacrifices sometimes are very real. The question is, will we follow him? The third thing I see in this passage is that it's up to us to either take or reject the challenge. Fairness isn't the issue in discipleship. Again, what matters is commitment. Will we follow? Comparison is neither helpful nor right. So we need to quit trying to compare apples to oranges, our weaknesses with somebody else's strengths, or vice versa. What matters is obedience. It involves love. Our love for God with a selfless love, not just a friendship, but agape love. Oh, we say, well, we all love God, but, but sometimes the best we can do in our loving God is just a friendship, a phileo love. Jesus wants to enable us by his spirit to be able to love with agape. And only he can change our heart so that that kind of love can flow. King David long ago prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. You know, what God promised to do, he can do. And if he says that he can take out the heart of stone and put a heart of flesh, he can do it. If he tells us that he can fill us with his spirit and enable us to keep his decree, he can do that. So, Jesus changed Peter's heart. Something happened to Peter on the day of Pentecost that made him different. Yes, he had to have some coaching. Yes, he had to clean up the broken relationship, but, but he was enabled to love the way he ought. God's promise and its fulfillment are in the Old Testament and in the New. For instance, through his prophet Ezekiel, God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. In the book of Acts, we, we read about that, how after Pentecost and after some expansion of the church, the disciples had come together in what we call the Jerusalem Conference and and they were talking about it, and they're talking about how the Gentiles also were being filled with the Spirit. And the conclusion is, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. Well, what was it like? They said he made no distinction between them, between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. That is to take the selfishness out, to take the ego out of us and, and allow us to love God with a whole heart, with a godly love. So the challenge before us today is like it was back then to Peter, to be a follower of Jesus with a pure heart. It's a challenge that Jesus places before you and me today as well as to Peter back on that day. And if we allow him to, this Jesus, who rose from the dead, will equip us with his love through his spirit so that we can love with a godly love. It requires an answer, of course, from each of us. Will you follow me? And I just want you to know that no answer is an answer. And dragging our feet, of course, is dangerous. So now, 
is really no longer about Peter. It's about you and me. Are we going to be followers of the risen Lord? It's a definitive moment. I have to answer that question. You have to answer that question. It's Jesus' challenge to each of us, to every person on the face of the earth, to everyone who would be his disciple, follow me. It's a call. He really does call us into his fellowship and into his kingdom. But I have to tell you, it's also a great privilege.